Yes, yeah, so and my paper is entitled Sexual Misconduct in the Music Industry Then and Now, and then in this case is the 1960s. I'd say this paper is very much still a work in progress, sort of a work in progress because I did sort of, you know, in all these revelations over the last year, all these dis discussions we've had, I started thinking about what I had done before in relation to those discussions, and then I also started thinking about what we could do next. So I think this paper is a bit of a mixed bag of sort of looking back and sort of trying to think of ways we could uh, maybe change things. And I was also really interested in Helen's paper because there was quite a bit of overlap there with, I think, the final part of this paper. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Um, so as we all know, late 19, um, 2017, so a global trend of people, chiefly women, speaking about their experiences of sexual misconduct and harassment. The revelations affected industries and institutions across the globe, indicating a problem of epidemic proportions. The music industry did not escape unharmed. Within just two months of the initial Weinstein accusations, there had been exposés on harassment in Sweden, in the UK and Australia. Also in 2017, the second part of a report on mental health in the music industry by Gross and Musgrave argued that sexual abuse and har harassment contributed to the considerable and widespread mental health issues within the industry. This paper seeks to put these discussions into historical context, examining the recent revelations in relation to experiences of women who were active in the industry in the 1960s. So this starts with um, a bit of reflection, looking back. The recent discussions inspired me to return to the interview data I gathered for my PhD thesis at the beginning of this decade. So I did interviews with 33 female musicians who were active um, in England between 1962 and 1971. To my dismay, I recall that I had been told stories of sexual harassment, but decided not to use them. In the thesis, I explained this as follows, and sorry for the long quote of my PhD. I discovered that the participants were interested in whether my representations of them would serve their own objectives, whatever they may have been. It was, then, of crucial importance to treat the interviewees with utmost respect. Although it was them who, in the interview situation, decided which stories to tell, I had the power, and consequently the responsibility, to reinterpret those stories afterwards. It is the researcher who decides which statements and accounts to use, and in which context. For example, and here's the, here's the really relevant bit, I came across personal revelations on what I would describe as sensitive matters and was faced with a dilemma as to whether or not to include them. Although the interviewees appeared to be perfectly agreeable to my discussing them in the thesis, I decided not to include certain sensitive revelations as they were not my stories to tell. And then I go on to say that I also excluded some other stuff like gossip and hearsay and also anything that proved to be factually incorrect. But yeah, I was quite shocked to read this last year. Um, but going, going back to sort of um, what I was going through at that time, notwithstanding the focus of the project on women musicians, I endeavoured to adopt as gentle, neutral and non-political an approach as possible. In the interviews, I avoided asking questions about feminism or being a woman. I wanted to write about the participants in the way that I felt that they wanted me to discussing them as musicians, for once, rather than as women. The beginnings of the project were also somewhat idealised, which, have, have, which may have also affected my choice of stories. My objective was to give a voice to, to musicians whose contribution had so often been overlooked in popular music histories. Ultimately, I hope to be able to tell a positive and inspiring story about women's participation in 1960s British popular music. This can be linked with a broader phenomenon within popular music studies which, as pointed out in a recent article by Strong and Rush, has often highlighted the, the positive elements of popular music. Although I referred to sexual misconduct in my thesis, I didn't tell those stories. I swept them under the carpet as they did not fit the overall narrative, and I was worried that the participants might regret telling me these stories later on. I thought that I was protecting them, and myself, and felt that there were more important themes, more empowering themes to concentrate on. In hindsight though, only alluding to these stories was not enough. 
a bit of terminology and context. So I'm using uh, sexual misconduct as an umbrella term which covers a range of behaviour both legal and illegal. It was mainly chosen for its current popularity, I'd say. In hindsight, sexual harassment would have perhaps been more appropriate considering the focus on the 1960s, as earlier writing on the topic usually uses this term. Regardless of which of these terms is used, we are referring to unwanted and inappropriate sexual behaviour, usually taking place in the workplace, or other situation where such behaviour is not expected to appear. The stakeholders are usually not of equal standing within the frame of reference they share. To put this into historical context in the UK, it's important to note that the Sex Discrimination Act only came into its existence in 1975. This was five years after the Equal Pay Act. Catherine McKinnon's groundbreaking sexual harassment of working women, a case of sex discrimination, which argued that sexual harassment was indeed a form of discrimination, was only published in 1979. As late as in the early 1990s, communication studies scholar Julia T. Wood noted that sexual harassment had been overlooked due to its status as an unrecognized phenomenon prior to the mid-70s, which is also the time frame of my PhD. Um, sexual harassment or misconduct didn't have a name or a label or a description. Wood called for examination of narratives and stories, each within their historical and institutional context, to reveal how harassment worked and how it could be reduced. A bit on my participants' views on the music industry in the 60s overall. Um, they, were, they were quite varied, as you can imagine. The positive aspects of music were often um, highlighted, so stories about the joys of music making and um, the camaraderie between musicians. Um, there was a lot of nostalgia there when they were discussing these experiences. But I also heard a lot of more negative stories, stories about being ignored, being discriminated against, and finally being uh, sexually harassed and the looming casting couch. The position of female performers was personally articulated by one of my study participants who remarked that there had been a saying within the industry, and I quote, if she looks as good as she sounds, you're on to a winner, which to her signified how female musicians were, and I quote again, treated then, and God help us, are probably treated now. The industry emerged as a man's world in which women performers' roles were frequently both problematic and definitely very clearly defined. Female singers were commonly viewed in terms of their visual contribution and not considered as real musicians, whereas female instrumentalists were so atypical that their very existence was rarely acknowledged. The participants used words such as tough, cutthroat and sexist to describe the industry. The power relations and imbalance allowed sexual, sexual misconduct to happen and to flourish. Many of us have probably um, encountered um, George Melly's revolt into style, the pop arts in the 50s and 60s, which was published in 1970. In that book, he made the following blistering remark. The whole pop scene is surrounded and frequently penetrated by exploiters, both commercial and sexual. My interviews provided plenty of evidence indicating that both sexual and commercial exploitation were prevalent and well known. Concentrating on the former, how did these sexual exploiters actually operate? Stories of this type were often told when the question, what obstacles, if any, did you face in your career, was asked. Some stories were reminiscent of those told about Weinstein, with the casting couch, dodgy auditions and meetings in hotels. One, participants were, one participant was promised a number one hit if she would have agreed to have meetings with a range of men. Another interviewee called auditions horrible and seedy without actually elaborating. One participant was underage when, when her manager had been requested to leave her in London for the weekend in order for her to star in a film with a teen idol. Within the DIY scene, the experience of recording could be ruined by having to sleep in the same room as the producer and having to, and I quote, sleep with one eye open. The impact of such incidents could be devastating. Several participants disclosed that such episodes were the main reason why they gave up music, as one interviewee discussed, and I quote, That was the obstacle. After that, I just lost interest. 
If someone says to you, it doesn't really matter what you do, this is the only thing that's going to get you there, you don't really bother that much more. Another one added that meeting a promoter had ruined and spoiled everything. All these stories were told by participants whose involvement with the sort of the, the mainstream music industry was relatively short. These incidents were actually career defining for them. Feeling powerless and defeated, they could no longer see a future for, some, for themselves in music. Providing a different perspective, a participant with a long career stated, and I quote, when you got to a certain position, nobody bothered you. However, the statement obviously indicates that harassment could occur prior to one obtaining a more powerful position. So what were their survival strategies like? I, I would first say that these stories of misconduct, they were there, but they were not really that common. Um, as I, but as I said before, I didn't ask any questions that were really re related to such issues. Um, one can envisage that if the questions had been different, more stories would have been told. Nonetheless, the fact that one needed to be very tough and streetwise and or benefit from protection was referred to across the interviews, pretty much all of them, indicating that everyone was at least very much aware of um, Melly's exploiters. Protection from chaperones, managers, parents and band members really was a reoccurring theme. Although the 1960s supposedly offered a more progressive approach to life and sought to challenge the values of the 50s generation, this did not necessarily mean that it proposed to alter the division of labor between the sexes or what was considered to be suitable behavior for men and women. Working in music was an unusual career choice for a young woman and many participants' parents were at least initially less than enthusiastic about it. Many ended up being chaperoned by their own parents, which some of them viewed as an advantage in hindsight, even though they didn't necessarily appreciate it as much in the 1960s. And many interviewees in bands reported that their band members had been very protective of them, and that this was something that they really appreciated. Some indicated that they had benefited from being romantically attached, as they were viewed as being less available than single women. Having a professional manager who kept Melly's exploiters at bay was certainly crucial. It was clear that one needed to be careful and surround herself with the right people. <clears throat> so how did these examples, um, do they substantially differ from the stories we've, um, we've heard over the last year? The chief differences can be found in the level of detail and explicitness but essentially the stories are very similar. We should be very concerned about the timelessness of these stories and that people who have experienced harassment are only now starting to feel empowered to tell their stories. Last year, <coughs> Ross and Musgrave argued that the music industry as a working environment is, and I quote, antisocial and unsympathetic, adding that some musicians experience sexual abuse, harassment, bullying and coercion more work is required that looks at inequality, discrimination, lack of diversity, and how that impacts the working conditions and climate. The environment that they describe comes across as frighteningly similar to the world outlined by my, my participants in the 1960s. Correspondingly, recent surveys by Ask Professional and the Incorporated Society of Musicians both uncovered a culture of sexual misconduct within the creative sector that clearly needs to be addressed. <clears throat> Due to a large number of freelancers, tackling the problem is less straightforward than in many other sectors. For instance, sexual harassment training programs, which one can imagine companies might be interested in investing after the events in the last year, are difficult to implement. The Ask Professional survey also revealed that being a freelancer may increase the probability of being sexually harassed. The, sec uh, the self-employed workforce is vulnerable in this sense, and freelancers are unlikely to report harassment in fear of not being hired again. Importantly, and this very much links with Helen's paper, <coughs> what, can, can, what can be done to ensure that the next generation of musicians and industry practitioners, many of whom, if not all, will have portfolio careers, are no longer affected? Gross and Musgrave recommend that mental health should be embedded within the curriculum within music education 
music education courses. This should also apply to sexual misconduct and harassment, and uh, I'd say also gender issues um, more generally. There's certainly a need to do this. A recent survey on sexual misconduct at higher education performing arts institutions taken by 600 students highlighted that misconduct did exist and that students were afraid to report it, which is obviously very, very worrying. The Student Services Department at my institution, which is BIM London, undertook an initiative entitled Not OK last year. A gig and training sessions were organised. The gig was very well attended, as you could imagine, whereas the training programme was taken by a much smaller group of students than anticipated. Making training part of the actual curriculum would surely reach a much larger number of students, and this is very much needed, as we, um, I'm sure you all agree. Returning to an earlier theme in this paper, Claire Chapman, Chapman and Kunkel promoted narratives as a tool to raise awareness of sexual harassment. Stories, both personal and collective, could be used as a starting point at interactive workshops. Real-life scenarios could be played out and then discussed and inter interrogated. It is of crucial importance that sexual harassment training is not done to tick boxes and comprise lecturing and cringeworthy videos. I'd be, I'd be interested in exploring what my students would make of the stories that my interviewees, who are now in their 70s, told me. Could they relate? On the day of his arrest, Harvey Weinstein's lawyer Benjamin Brachman pointed out that Weinstein did not, and I quote, invest in, invent the casting culture in Hollywood. Whilst the focus on identifying perpetrators such as Weinstein has offered a starting point, it is obvious that we need to move from these examples to prevention as soon as possible, now that we are finally talking about this. Within the creative industries in the UK, the extensive nature of the problem has finally been acknowledged and the next step is a move from surveys to experimenting with potential fixes and solutions. <laughs> if anyone's interested in all those surveys, they're all here. There are quite a few, quite a few of them I've done in the last year. All make very interesting reading. Thank you. Um, there must be some questions. I know lunch news, but mm -hmm. um, there are some really interesting um, uh, crossing between the first and third papers in, in particular. Um, I was interested in the pressure of that 18 to 25 group that Helen um, talked about earlier and how often these the same problems come to affect new generations and yet all they've got is the kind of well it's always happened this yeah. way and the, the way in which um, you see potential to help them to navigate at that really crucial time in their career as they move out of education and into the industry. Mm -hmm. um, the, the responsibility seems also to lie with those people who are most vulnerable to its um, problems. Could you say a little bit about how you, you can see ways to tackle it's a really tricky one because I, I, when I started writing this paper, I was writing about the 1960s, and then when I was writing this, I started thinking about my students more and more and more. So I think there's a, there's definitely a there's there's definitely some sort of a program there. I don't know whether there will be a research project there, but it's, um, as I said, our students student support department started to work on this last year, and I sort of. Um, try to gather some data on that. And I don't think the intervention was particularly successful. It was, I think it was amazing that they did it, but I think it would need to be in a much more systematic way. And we need to reach those people who wouldn't sort of volunteer to take part in training programs. So I think this is very much a discussion that everyone should be having. Um, everyone outside education is having this discussion now. And this really, I think this, our students are crucial group that we should be focusing on. If we want things to change, it needs to, we need to start with them. So, yeah, so it's, at the moment it's just like a bundle of ideas and I'm sort of bursting to try out something. Yes. With, with hopefully with some success. But I even have these sort of ideas of getting my participants together with my students. So I'm sort of dreaming of such scenarios as well. Because I believe like listening to my students and listening to those those people now in their 70s, their experiences of music making and music industry really aren't that dissimilar. Yes, and question. Yeah, I, I would have heard, that was great, by the way. And 
I would have asked a question straight away, but I don't know quite what I'm asking and how to ask it. So I'm going to try and work my way into it with a, an observation, first of all, since the Weinstein thing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that, you know, obviously music didn't escape and harm or whatever, but I, I've been amazed by the opposite in a way. Mm. Because surely rock and roll is like so much worse in, yeah. in terms of how it, in, in its content, not no less, in terms of how it mm. promotes that. So when you're talking about, and I really like the way that you're relating the research from the 60s into something like, you know, how do I, how does this apply to my students and how, mm. how do they deal with the same challenges, which is still prevalent. Um, in a certain area, I was also, that's why I'm sort of confused about what I want, what I want to ask. Like my, my world is kind of noise music and electronic, and contemporary electronic, and that, that's a place where the, the gender imbalance is really starting mm. to be disintegrated. So, a lot of the stories in Helen's talk, I was thinking, well, this is in the world of the bands and, and, mm. and rock paradigms, which is sort of hopefully kind of becoming dissolved now. Maybe not. But what I, yeah, what, I, what I'm actually asking is, what do you think, when you're looking at that scale from your research into the 60s and, and applying it to students now, where do you really target the, the criticism and who do you start to start thinking, where, where can we undermine this? Because I'm, I'm going back to what the point I made at the beginning, I'm amazed at how, how little rock and roll has actually been drawn into this, and I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for the Frank Zappa stories. You know, when does somebody say, when does somebody who's still active today say, I'm ashamed I ever worked with Frank Zappa? You know, because this is the weird thing about Woody Allen, for instance, in one instance. The amount of people that come up and say, I wish I'd never even spoken to the guy. When's that going to happen in rock and roll? And is that a way that that could be? You'd start to address this with students, you know. Do they start to mistrust things that they trusted? Sorry, it's really a tiny question. <laughs> so, so many ideas here. Yeah. But it, you, you're probably right that I've also been surprised as to how... I think everyone's... If we, if we think about the world of rock in particular, I think everyone's expecting this sort of stuff to happen there. And I don't know if you saw this, but I, someone forwarded me an article just a couple of days ago on Atlantic Records. And there was a, a female um, ANR executive who had now published a, a story full of these sort of stories. I think it only came out a couple of days ago, or is about to come out. So perhaps, actually, the moment has come that we've been waiting for. Um, but um, yeah, you're right that it's, it's quite surprising that it hasn't been affected that much. Or maybe because, yeah, there have been these sort of exposés, as I said, there was a um, radio program here, um, about 2,000 women in the Swedish music industry um, wrote this um, um, open letter. And there was, a, there was a quite a big thing in Australia as well, and I'm sure this has happened elsewhere as well. But they haven't necessarily got the publicity of those exposés on, let's say, the film industry or politics. For some reason, perhaps it's I wonder, I wonder if it might be because in some some of those that have got more attention are in parts of industry which are meant to be more kind of squeaky clean. So yeah. you know, you've seen yeah. it in cathedral schools, you've seen it in the church. Yeah, um, <laughs> Richard, but I'm not allowed to mention. Um, so um, whereas there's a, perhaps more of an assumption that it's always been this way in, in rock music. Yeah, everyone's think. everyone's read all these ridiculous books on lecture, the Seth Green and Dudley Crew and stuff. So everyone sort of expects this, this sort of thing to happen, I guess, or at least did in the past. Yeah, I mean, I rock, rock and roll is always, they're supposed to be part of its attraction, isn't it? There's a slight amorality and not immorality. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I came out of the independent music scene, but one of the, which was obviously had a strong feminist um, element to it, but I think one thing, because I think a lot of what happens in the music industry, apart from outright harassment, it happens everywhere. Is this idea of microaggressions and women just feeling they are devalued and if they're active, then they're a bitch or whatever. You know, so it could be something as sort of obvious as a handbook. I mean, I actually don't think a lot of young men understand what those kind of microaggressions are. You know, they, don't, they don't get it. It's part of their behavioural culture, and it's hard to challenge that smaller, why are you treating me as if I don't exist, kind of aggression. So, I mean, students should be given handbooks as part of their initiations on how to act 
as an adult in the you know new world, or how to spot your own bad behaviour and others. Mm -hmm. Because I do actually think it goes unthought of, unexamined. Mm -hmm. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.